to have you begin. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, just very briefly, I do want to echo what was said about COVID. I haven't had, uh, I haven't spoken in front of you for a little while, but indeed, uh, we are in very difficult days. I want to thank the partners who have worked with us uh, since the spring in our county to do the right things and to be uh, more controlling than the state or the country have been. That has helped us. We are in a better position than the state. Uh, but we are still deteriorating in this ca county as well in our community. We've had seven employee cases in the past several days. Um, these are dangerous months ahead. As mentioned, uh, just for example, the state uh, daily case average is up sixfold in the last six weeks uh, and is not pointed downward at all. So stay tuned. We'll be continuing to talk about next steps uh, for that. But I echo and affirm all that has been said tonight. For tonight, and I'll hand it over to Senator Vi Simpson shortly for very brief introductions as well. I just want to, as you noted, we're focusing on the hospital reuse, the draft uh, final master plan. I want to thank the team that has worked so hard on that from Skidmore Owens Merrill uh, and many other partners inside the city government uh, and more than 500 members of the public for months of feedback. Uh, and I'll just in, in advance thank the council. You've had members, including particularly Isabel Piedmont Smith and Jim Sims uh, on the steering and oversight committees, as well as uh, Kate Rosenbarger and Matt um, Flaherty helping out in, in the selection process. Thank you for your work and thank you tonight for your attention, reactions, feedback to this. Uh, it's an ongoing process, but I welcome your uh, advice and feedback and reactions for this once in a century very exciting project. And let me hand it over to co-chair of the uh, steering committee, Senator Vi Simpson, who's done spectacular work helping steer this for years. And Vi, I'll hand it to you and then we'll, we'll hand it over to the presenters. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, and I just want to reiterate my thanks to uh, the members of the Common Council for giving us this opportunity to talk to you tonight and to show you some of the work that's been done um, we've been, many of us have been working on this issue for five, going on six years now. And, uh, and we have had ups and downs and sideways motions as we've been working on it. Um, but it's getting to the point now where it's very exciting. We have, uh, we have, it, it, we're very close now to the culmination of all of that work. And I really wanna take this opportunity to thank the hundreds of people who have worked, not only those who have served uh, past and present on the hospital reuse committee, but also the hundreds of people who have um, taken advantage of the opportunities for public input through public forums and through written comments. Um, we have collected all of that information and what you're going to see tonight is uh, really a, a, a polished draft. It's not the final, but it is, uh, it's a draft still of, the, um, of our planning framework for going forward. And I hope that you're as excited as we are to, uh, to see it. It's, um, we've come a long way and we have a long way to go. This is a long-term project, years and years uh, in the past and going forward. So we're anxious to hear your comments and uh, answer any questions that you might have. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mick, who's going to introduce the, uh, the planning uh, personnel. Thank you, Senator Simpson and Mayor Hamilton. Uh, Mick Reneisen, Deputy Mayor, I serve as the city's project lead on the project review committee. And I thought I would start by sharing with you a little bit of where we've been in the last five years uh, so that you have some context for what you're about to see from our planning consulting team, uh, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. So uh, just a refresher, city, the city entered into a purchase agreement with IU Health back in May of 2018 to acquire the 24 acres that you see on this slide outlined in yellow, not the dotted line, but the hard line in yellow. That agreement took several years to negotiate and concluded that again in May of 2018. The entire area that is currently zoned medical in this area is close to 70 acres. And you can see that uh, with the additional dotted line. I know it's a little out of scale, but there's actually 70 acres in total that are zoned medical in this area. I think the community is now well aware that IU Health will be moving to their new site, their beautiful new 
a half a billion dollar investment on the east side of our community uh, sometime in late 2021. And as is part of the purchase agreement, it states that the city will receive a clear and remediated site when the transfer of property occurs for the main site. And that main site is where the main hospital exists, all the sort of middle block between the dash lines to the west and the block east of Rogers uh, uh, is a different parcel that does not require the, the IU Health folks to remediate that site. Uh, the city has the option to keep two structures on the site per our agreement. One of those is the parking structure and the other is the core building. And to date, the city has opted to keep the parking structure and we have until the end of December to make a decision on the core building. And note that we anticipate taking a recommendation um, on the core building to the Redevelopment Commission, which is the owner of this site in December for their consideration. Throughout this process, starting back in 2015, as Senator Simpson said, a 30 plus member hospital reuse committee consisting of local residents uh, from all walks of life have helped steer the project forward. And as I've told uh, Co-Chair Simpson, you're not done after this. It'll take years ahead for your group to continue to help shepherd the project forward. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, I wanted to outline a little bit about what the timeline is and some of the steps that have been taking place and what's coming forward. So with the assistance of that big hospital reuse committee, the city has selected a master planning team. That's the Skidmore, Owings and Merrill group back in January. Together, we've conducted stakeholder and small group interviews that occurred in May and early June. The first public forum was held on June 16th. And mind you, it was held in the format that we're all getting used to. Uh, over the last nine months on Zoom. And we had 200 participants in that first forum. And that forum asked the participants what they would like to see on the site as it redeveloped. So it was really wide open at the very beginning stages back in June. At the second public forum, which was held on August 6th, there were still uh, more than 100 in attendance. This forum focused on economic conditions and the early conceptual design options reflecting feedback from forum one and input from approximately 300 survey respondents between those two forums. The third public forum occurred on October 6. There were 74 folks that attended that meeting. At the meeting, we shared the final, or I'm sorry, the refined plan based on the comments from those received throughout the previous two forums and the surveys that were part of that process. Since that third forum, SOM has refined the draft master plan to reflect, reflect the scale of the proposed redevelopment rather than the character of the redevelopment opportunity. So after tonight, between now and the end of the process, which we think will be by the end of the year, uh, the final opportunity to comment will be after we post tonight's presentation, the full recording of the presentation, as well as just the PowerPoint that everyone's about to see on our website, bloomingtonhospitalsite.com. That's all one word, bloomingtonhospitalsite.com. Uh, where you can not only find tonight's presentation, but all the other information leading up to tonight. There's a form, a Google form that folks can fill out after this evening's presentation and share your comments on that Google form. And those will be considered and we'll take them all the way through November 29th. And I'll repeat this at the end for those that might be joining later. And just again, if you have any questions or suggestions, if you go to bloomingtonhospitalsite.com, there's a wealth of information there that have informed uh, the hospital reuse committee all along. So if you'll go to the next slide, Rachel, I'll just conclude by saying the draft master plan being presented tonight builds on past planning efforts, including the Urban Land Institute report that was commissioned back in 2018. That's the report on the right side of this slide and the city's 2018 comprehensive plan. And in addition, the current UDO mapping process that is currently underway. So all of these planning efforts are, um, are part of the discussion and will be part of the decision-making process moving forward. And you can see on this slide, I won't read them to you, some of the goals that were identified for the site by the community during that part of the planning process. I think it's important to note that a master plan develops concepts and a framework for development rather than a master plan. What it doesn't do is not create an architecturally designed building that will ultimately be built on the site. That comes later as the site becomes available for development. And while the main hospital site will not be available until probably early 2023, after the demolition and remediation is completed, 
Some of the areas outside of the main site may be available later in 2021. Also, uh, we'll just reiterate that for, for all future steps after this master plan is completed, uh, the public will continue to have input as those development projects come forward. And we'll talk about that at the end of the presentation. So now I'd like to turn it over to Rachel Mamani from SOM to lead us through the next part of the presentation. Rachel? Unmute. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you, Mick, uh, for the introduction. Um, as uh, Mick mentioned, um, we've been on board since April of 2020 um, when this process began. Um, and from the very beginning, uh, we saw input from the community um, with the help of our consultants, uh, CORE, uh, as well as uh, Mary Kropinski, who is local to the community, um, to gather uh, valuable input um, from uh, various uh, community stakeholders on how to move this project forward. And um, being that we are in different times, um, we had to do community engagement, uh, not like we normally would, which would be in person. And so we've been able to utilize Zoom. Um, as you can see on, on the right there, um, sort of Bloomington Bunch, uh, all in blue there, uh, as we've uh, come to be known um, through this process. Um, but we've been able to utilize these platforms along with surveys, um, the website that you can see on the top uh, right of the page um, to gather that input. Um, and since then, we've been working to translate that input um, into a comprehensive master plan, as well as guidelines um, for this 24 acre project site. Um, we're also working now in tandem to translate this vision um, into uh, potential zoning updates um, for, for uh, later approval um, by the city plan commission and common council. So throughout this process, um, we have gathered over 539 unique touch points uh, from the Bloomington community. So this has come in the form of one-on-one -on -one interviews done by CORE as well as Mary Kropinski in the community. And these been, have been on a, a wide range of topics um, at, to gather important and valuable information to inform this process. Um, we've also met with a variety of community associations, uh, the neighboring uh, neighborhood associations, McDowell Gardens and Prospect Hill. Um, and we've also had, as Mick has mentioned, um, these three public forums leading up to today. Um, so in that way, we've been able to gather a lot of uh, valuable input to put towards what you'll see during today's presentation. Um, during our last public forum, we were able to get uh, more interactive in um, getting a uh, live uh, sort of polling uh, from the audience, as well as kind of working um, in a more sort of workshop fashion with you all. And it, in each of these public forum meetings, um, we've gathered uh, the information from the transcript, from the chat features, from um, taking screenshots of work that we've done during these meetings, just to make sure that we are hearing what you have said um, throughout this whole process. And one of the key questions really early on was how do we translate uh, the values of Bloomington uh, and the city goals for the future of this uh, site and apply them um, to the planning process. And so um, what we've come up with are uh, the, what we've been calling planning principles that really have captured um, ideas from the past planning efforts that uh, uh, Mick went through um, with the comprehensive plan and the ULI study, as well as uh, community input from this effort um, to kind of boil down to what you see here with these nine different principles um, that range from sort of highest and best use, um, diversity of housing types and mixes of uses. Um, really, we heard um, activation is important, but maybe not in the form of retail, but maybe those come in the form of community amenities um, and new hubs uh, for the community that will really kind of strengthen the connections between people and the place. Um, and in addition, um, we focused a lot really on the public realm um, and how we would um, create a people first a street design, um, creating a well scaled uh, network of uh, spaces um, and well scaled blocks and ultimately um, came up with what we're calling a flexible framework um, for future development. So thinking about the fact that, you know, as Mick said, we're not, you know, 
designing the architecture that goes there, but really kind of creating uh, the framework and the kit of parts for the future success of the site, making sure that we're enveloping everything that we've heard from the community to date. And so we'll bring you through some of those planning framework ideas. And so if we could just take a minute to kind of scale back um, to the more sort of regional um, sort of area, we found these uh, diagrams to be really helpful in, in um, kind of understanding the importance of this site in the relationship to both downtown the university and these other really um, important developments taking place along the B-line. Um, we've heard it been called this sort of Bloomington string of pearls. And we're noting that the hospital site um, is really uh, an important uh, key feature along that string of pearls, as it's been called. Um, we also see the site as sort of a next link in expanding the sort of network of both um, sort of cyclist and pedestrian trails um, within uh, the area. Um, we see this site uh, having the ability to connect to the larger park system from um, the university and uh, the sort of assets downtown. Um, and then uh, down west and south to both the Twin Lakes Park, as well as um, Switchyard to the south and in between RCA and Wapani Parks. Um, so really a key link um, in the overall community and hoping that this could become a new sort of uh, center of gravity um, that will uh, kind of enhance quality of life for everyone in, in the surrounding area and really um, filling in a void in um, the sort of neighborhood fabric that exists today. So here we're looking once again at the study area and Mick had uh, shown this earlier, kind of a smaller version. Um, but just to reiterate, the, the site to be redeveloped um, is the 24 acre hospital site um, shown in the solid yellow line. Um, and in addition to the area to be, or the additional acres to be rezoned is uh, shown in the dash yellow line. Um, and that's to the west. And just to orient you all, um, this image is facing south and so north is to the bottom right of the page and you can see the um, B line along the uh, eastern side of the development which is on the left side of this page and second street all along here with building trades park um, so the existing site the the hospital as well as the parking garage which uh, as Nick said will remain uh, the core building to potentially remain um, but this is kind of how we'll be looking at the site um, moving through the next series of slides. But just quickly to um, kind of look at some of those existing um, sort of characteristics of the site, we had the opportunity to do a couple of walking tours early on. And then again, more recently, as you can see the, the fall coloring in those photos there. Um, but we think it's very helpful and important to really uh, understand the diversity uh, and unique edges, um, as well as the sort of existing scale that exists there today. And so we can see in the upper left image really how sort of tall the actual existing hospital building is today. And so that kind of gives us a sense of the opportunity that exists along Second Street for some of that height. And then in contrast, on the bottom left of the page, we can see some of that smaller, more uh, fine grain uh, fabric to the south in the McDole Garden neighborhood. And then on the top right, um, looking at existing amenities, the B line is just an amazing asset to have adjacent to this site in terms of connectivity to um, the larger area, um, as well as um, the sort of historic context and fabric that we have on the site today, um, like the core administrative building. So there are a lot of um, great opportunities to work with on the site. And so um, what we'll do is we'll walk through a series of updated diagrams. Um, you all, whoever attended the forum three saw a, a similar series of diagrams, um, which we've since um, improved upon with your input. Um, so these will show up, show a buildup of the uh, master plan concept or framework as we've been referring to it in, in these conversations. Um, the view is similar to the bird's eye view that we just were looking at. Um, north is to the bottom right of the page, and this will be towards downtown. Um, 
Here uh, along the east side of the development is the B line with the Kroger in that parking lot. Um, along the north side um, is Second Street as well as Building Trades Park. And in the red coloration, these are the buildings um, on the hospital site um, to be demolished by IU Health. And then the surrounding yellow buildings are the additional buildings on site that will also be um, demolished by the city um, in the near future. So one of the aspects of the site is the, the great amount of topography um, that happens and that the hospital today is very much on a hill and um, we see in the future that there'll probably be the need to regrade the site to some extent um, to create accessibility on a new series of roads um, and um, connections to take place through the site. So there will be some amount of cut and fill to take place and this will be um, further designed as the project um, moves forward. Um, but one of the opportunities that we mentioned in the past um, is Second Street Corridor coming through adjacent to the site. We see this as being the sort of active community corridor and the uh, ability to create uh, an active edge um, bordering the Prospect Hill uh, neighborhood today. Um, and Regrading the site will be done in coordination with the improvement of uh, existing streets today, like Second Street that we just showed you, as well as First Street, which will be happening in the um, coming years, um, along with the creation of new streets, um, which will really help to create a new um, series of complete streets um, to connect the Prospect Hill and uh, Mictal uh, Garden neighborhoods. And so some of those uh, new streets will be an extension of Fairview Street connecting Mictal uh, Gardens to um, Building Trades Park, um, Jackson Street from Wiley Street into the site. Um, we have proposed improvements for Rogers Street. And then another uh, new street would be shifting Madison Street such that it aligns with the existing Madison Street um, in Prospect Hill neighborhood. Um, so these series of streets we see as uh, neighborhood connectors, um, really restitching this sort of mega block that the uh, hospital site is today um, back into the neighborhood fabric. In addition to the north-south uh, connections, uh, we looked at extending a greenway uh, from the B-line west terminating uh, towards the uh, existing Hunter School today. Um, and the green light space, um, I mean, we've talked about it from the beginning and I've gotten, gained a lot of input um, from the public on this aspect. Um, we see it as a space for um, new public amenities um, as well as important uh, stormwater feature. Um, but it will also be paired with a um, new sort of slow traffic street, which will provide important access to each of the development parcels and to the interior of the site. So we see it as being a, a people street first, or people first street, pardon me, um, and a great new amenity for this future development. And by making these necessary connections with the streets and the internal greenways coming through, uh, we create a series of 10 well-scaled blocks for flexible development in the future. Um, and you can see the notation here that these blocks are about 340 feet by two, 320 feet and are very similar to the scale of the existing Prospect Hill neighborhood fabric today. So, this flexible framework um, that we've created, we see as being able to support a range of densities as well as a range of housing types. And so, as you can see on the key uh, to the left of the page, um, smaller scale uh, single family homes, um, we see those as potential to be adjacent to that um, fine grain fabric of the McDole Garden neighborhood. Um, stepping up in density then to um, townhome model or fourplexes um, to increase the density a little bit up to um, low rise apartments um, and then up to more mid rise multifamily apartments um, adjacent to the existing parking garage amenity as well as along that active community corridor of Second Street. So we see this as the opportunity to provide more height 
um, as well as the mix of uses. Um, so what we've come up with is sort of a very diverse um, and varying range of housing types that could be flexibly arranged in many different ways um, throughout the development. And uh, we really reflected on the uh, housing study that was done in Bloomington and the need for the additional, I think, 2,500 some units of housing that will be needed to support the projected population growth. And we worked with um, SB Friedman, marketing consultant, to really um, estimate how many units could this site potentially hold. And, and they determined that the, um, the 24 acres uh, with the additional 52, so the uh, 76 acres total could support about 660 to 1,000 units. Um, ranging in affordability over the next um, 10 years. And so um, looking at uh, sort of what we've come up with in terms of design here today, we know that this site could support upwards of 800 units. So uh, one of the things that we heard from many residents in the community um, along with the importance of housing and housing that is affordable um, was uh, the importance of activation um, and community amenities and not just retail within the ground floor of these buildings um, to really support that walkable inclusive neighborhood um, that is so desired. Um, so to the left here is just uh, some of the many possibilities for uses within the community. And this is a list that has been added to um, throughout the community um, meetings. And so we heard a lot of good input um, as to potential uses during four and three. And again, uh, these are just possibilities. Um, final uses for the site um, for activating the ground floors would ultimately um, be part of a development proposal um, for each of these specific parcels. Um, but some of the things that we heard were um, daycares, um, both for adults and child childcare, um, the idea of sort of uh, many ages all existing in one place, this notion of livability um, and multi-generational living um, came up, um, a variety of uses, um, not just restaurants, but things like um, shared kitchens and cafes, um, maker spaces, and um, shared uh, um, shared workspaces, um, just a variety of things, but these have all been documented and can be referred to um, as the actual developments um, come to fruition. And then I just have a series of um, illustrative views of the massing. Um, so this is again from the same view where uh, downtown is facing, um, or downtown is this way, north is facing to the bottom right of the page. Um, but just to show the sort of scale um, of the, the development and that sort of stepping up in nature from um, the south to the north. And just kind of zooming in again to see this sort of um, diverse sort of fabric within the development and the potential that exists there um, today. And then a view from um, the south looking towards downtown um, with again, this nature of small fine grain, potentially single family detached homes, uh, the possibility for townhomes, some sort of attached model around a courtyard, um, stepping up to denser models like potentially fourplexes or lower scale, um, lower scale multifamily up to um, more mixed use uh, multifamily models, um, especially surrounding uh, the, the parking garage, which is such an asset for the site today. Um, and now I will pass it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Chris Merritt from Merritt Chase to bring you through um, the public realm framework um, that was created through this process. Great, thanks Rachel and hello everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be talking to you about um, this real incredible opportunity um, in front of you tonight. Um, as Rachel mentioned, I'm gonna talk through a little bit of the public realm framework that we developed um, for the master plan. Um, starting as Rachel talked a little bit about with the street network, um, as shown in blue here, 
Um, the blue is representing existing but improved streets. Um, and then the brown, um, the prim primarily uh, north-south streets are new um, streets. And then in, in the east-west direction, you can see that dashed line. That's this idea about this shared uh, flush street condition that I'll talk a little bit about in more detail. Um, and when we talk about streets, we're really talking about complete streets. Um, these are streets that really put people first. They um, prioritize people over cars, um, pedestrian, public realm space, as well as green infrastructure, furnishings, lighting, and, and space for active ground floor uses in buildings to really spill out into the street. Um, and so as we look at the opportunities around the development and, and within the master plan, looking at Second Street first, um, here looking east with the garage on the right, um, challenges of fast moving traffic, uh, multiple turn lanes and um, poor pedestrian experience and safety concerns for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, and so our proposed typical street section um, for Second Street um, the existing um, on the left and the proposed on the right, you can see um, we're suggesting a bit of a road diet with um, two 10-foot uh, travel lanes in either direction with parallel parking on the south side, the development side, um, with an over 20-foot um, kind of streetscape section before the development line. Um, and then along Building Trades Park, we're introducing um, a new 10-foot uh, uh, two-way uh, bike path that would connect um, the B-line all the way over to um, Walker Street where it would connect into an existing um, uh, bike path um, and then an enhanced uh, building trades park um, edge on that side of the development. Um, for First Street, we know that this is a project in the works and we're aligning uh, our vision with that project. Um, challenges here, this is uh, right at the core building on the left, um, lack of sidewalks or narrow sidewalk, um, so safety concerns um, for cyclists and pedestrians. Uh, proposed condition um, is to um, road diet um, the street slightly, provide parallel parking on each side, and then proper um, tree planting and sidewalk space um, uh, throughout. Uh, Rogers Street looking north, um, similarly poor pedestrian experience um, and safety concerns, introducing bike lanes on either side as well as improved um, sidewalk and streetscape planting. Um, and then a typical street section for those new north-south streets, Fairview, Jackson, and Madison, um, a, a 10 foot shared travel lane, bikes and cars, parallel parking on either side, and then a tree line planting buffer with sidewalks on either side. Um, and so it's with that uh, um, kind of framework that um, we've developed um, this draft final master plan. Um, and so, uh, you know, we really started to think about this plan um, and the development opportunity here with landscape and public space first, um, and that kind of setting the framework for development to fill in uh, within. And so um, throughout the Greenway and at active building corners and intersections, we're introducing a series of public plazas. Um, and then linking that together is this notion of these wetland gardens that um, came about through uh, public process um, and um, kind of weaving the whole development together through a series of connected green spaces that bring Building Trades Park um, through this new East-West Greenway to the B-Line. Um, and that all also functions for stormwater. Um, so the, the aim of the master plan is really to collect and retain all the stormwater on site. And so that's done through a series of these wetland gardens as well as bioswales along the edges um, of the streetscape. Um, and so just to show you a little bit, an enlargement of that east-west greenway flush street condition, um, starting um, on the west where Fairview Street um, would Connect Building Trades Park um, down through an improved intersection to the highest point in the development that we've suggested in a community overlook um, could be there, looking out over water, moving through a series of wetland gardens to a more community kind of stage uh, area at Rogers Street. Again, moving through a wetland garden over boardwalks and planting and kind of water feature areas through a, a plaza framed by uh, a a tree grove and lawn, um, and then a new kind of public plaza 
an expanded gateway um, at the B line itself. Um, and just some character images of each of those spaces. So this is um, you know, what some of those public plazas could look like. This is really the social heart and hub of the development. Um, and then in between those, you have these expanded gardens where it's a little more lush and intimately human scaled. Um, uh, following that, uh, these stormwater features that could either be more kind of natural um, or, or uh, a little bit more designed water feature like. Um, the courtyard spaces, a little more amenity space that could have play elements, spaces to gather, um, and potentially grow your own food. Um, and then this shared street, a really um, you know, important element of this plan, a space where cars, pedestrians, um, uh, um, cyclists, um, you know, really share the street and, uh, you know, um, it, this could be used for cars um, to access um, on a day to day basis, but it's really meant to be a kind of slow speed condition where pedestrians can feel kind of safe to cross the street um, and you could actually close the street um, for events. Um, and so this is an example of what that could look like kind of every day, day to day condition. Um, so this is as if you were hovering right above this street um, in the Greenway kind of looking east. So you're seeing Jackson Street and Rogers Street um, coming through there. So um, you see this flush street condition um, with bollards and lighting and street trees on either side. And then these wetland gardens that kind of bring you through the Greenway. Um, and you see that mixing of cars and cyclists and pedestrians across the space. And then, you know, you have this opportunity to close that street and really activate it with um, community programming, um, bringing uh, kind of festivals and, and art and stages and performances into the Greenway. So I'll hand it over to Doug to talk a little bit about um, some ideas for implementation. Thanks a lot, Chris. I, I think as you can see from each of our public meetings and definitely from our last public forum, we've tried very hard to bring these ideas into focus and to identify the recommendation and tools to deliver the vision. And as Mick mentioned earlier, this diagram highlights how portions of the site will be delivered in the condition in which they will be uh, provided back to the city. So in green, is the property of the hospital proper, that the buildings would be demolished and cleaned per the agreement. The sites in yellow would be transferred back to the city as is, and it's those sites that as mentioned earlier, could perhaps happen as quickly as uh, sometime later next year, 2021. Next slide. Throughout this process though, we've been talking about principles. We've been emphasizing the importance of connectivity but also the importance of the public realm as Chris just demonstrated. And this framework that you see on screen also provides the flexibility for the city and the community in to develop this site over many different phases, but to allow flexibility to adapt to changes in the market or other conditions that may come to light in the future. And so across these 10 parcels, not only does it give you a series of options and how to begin or to look at early phase development, but it is also an intentional way to provide diversity to, uh, between not only the scale and type of housing or mixed use product that would be provided, but also to engage perhaps multiple developers and multiple architects. So you create that richness um, that is seen throughout uh, the best parts of the Bloomington neighborhoods in and around the site. We've also been with the city looking at initial set of zoning recommendations that reflect different scales of mixed use as well as residential development that is intentionally done in a way to transition to the surrounding areas, but also to capitalize many of the important assets in and around the site. Next slide. And this master plan framework also considers ways to incrementally deliver parcels. As I mentioned before, this flexibility uh, within the plan 
allows us to look at some of the more immediate parcels, perhaps on the east, as well as what we're calling on the west there on First Street, as ways to build off existing assets, whether it's off of the B line and the Second Street, Morton Street connections that are already in place, or the available infrastructure of First Street uh, on Parcel 1 West. This also speaks to the availability of that land so that we can create a sense of place uh, and start to build this community on day one. Next. But we've considered those improvements and those early phases to also set up future phases and future investments that would extend to the balance of the site, perhaps some of the uh, larger development opportunities that exist along Second Street on either side of the existing parking garage, but also could be delivered in smaller phases, again, to support that range of diversity working with a host of developers and architects in delivering this vision. Next. And throughout this process, we've been tracking not only the development potential as Rachel highlighted, or as Chris mentioned in his presentation, the improvements to the public realm, but also the enabling projects that will support both the early phases as well as later phases of the project so that this can be done in a balanced and coordinated way, providing at, at this stage, not only flexibility, but the beginning outlines of a roadmap for the city to consider scenarios and options on how to develop the site over multiple phases. Next. So perhaps to conclude, and uh, if I can just have another minute or two, uh, I'd, I'd want to sort of summarize one of the things that came out very early in our conversations and walks around the site. And it's to define what is, Rachel, if you can go back, it's to define what is unique about Bloomington, but also the great potential this site provides. And many of you and, and the mayor himself spoke about reflecting the values of Bloomington. And so we've taken a first pass at some artists uh, illustrations of what that may be. And so we've got three views um, that start to communicate how these values can be reflected in the development of this very important site. And so as you can see here, this is a view uh, from the B line, almost standing in the parking lot outside the grocery store looking west. And you can see the hospital and the parking garage just in the background over that tree line. If you go to the next slide, Rachel, this is an early impression of how the greenway could come out and meet the B line so that you're welcome and greeted into this community. Chris had mentioned the idea of a plaza that could be used for a number of events and casual activities, but also that it sets up an approach to the ground floor of these buildings. Perhaps there's a coffee shop, or as Rachel mentioned, other community uh, uses located in the ground floor of these buildings that it's not all retail, but they contribute to the vibrancy um, of this place and the diversity of the people and communities that are welcomed into the site. Next. Similarly, we've talked about the plan and the principles really reflect a sense of transition uh, to the surrounding areas and that it's been tailored, the zoning, the recommendations have really been tailored to make those transitions as seamless as possible. And so this is a view on First Street looking up the hill. Um, you can see Fairview Street right where that crossing sign uh, jets out over the street itself. If you go to the next slide, Rachel, that perhaps as an early phase, when we talked about phase one West, we can look at developing a series of single family lots. Perhaps as we move further East, they can be uh, increased in density to duplexes, or as you can see on the other side of the street, even other types of multifamily and mixed use development. And it's this diversity between parcels that really contributes to what we think is incredible 
and unique opportunity given the scale of the site, but also the unique edges and transitions to the surrounding neighborhoods. Next. And perhaps the last view we'll share is along 2nd Street, looking back at, you're all familiar with the parking garage, and uh, this is a view from Building Trades Park. But what happens when we bring streets through so they meet 2nd Street, and we bring the connections from McDowell Gardens uh, up to uh, this part of the site? And what happens when we look at adding new buildings and density? And if you go to the next slide, we've done this with very careful consideration of scale, but also within these blocks, we look to create uh, greater variation in both the height and the massing, but also the quality of the architecture so that this speaks to the values of design, but also the attitudes about green sustainability and really a higher quality of life that's welcome and open to everyone. And so perhaps on that, uh, I can turn it back over to uh, Mick and the city for some closing remarks. Thank you, Doug. And I hope that the last slides you saw there, there were the, the ones that hopefully inspire you about the process. And again, remember, these are not the architecturally designed buildings that will be on the site, rather what might be potentially conceivable uh, over time as the site develops out. It's really important to us that as the process continues, our consultant will continue to get cost estimates for the public infrastructure, the public realm, as they call it, and, and that will update the master plan and some other elements that they'll be working on over the course of the next month. But we really need to hear uh, from the city residents what you think about this plan. And we want you to go to bloomingtonhospitalsite.com and fill out the Google form. Take your time to look at the presentation tonight. Scroll through these slides again at, you, at your time convenience and provide us those comments by November 29th. And remember our ultimate goal as a community and what this plan should represent is an adaptable, flexible master plan that guides the development of the site, allowing for the unknowns of our world, which we're all experiencing right now, that ultimately reacts to market conditions over the course of this multi-year, multi-phase development of the site. And we expect this to be at least a 10-year uh, project, if not longer than that. Note too that any development plans proposed by the public or by the private sector in the future will require review by city staff, by the Redevelopment Commission and the Plan Commission, and possibly the City Council, depending on the nature of the proposal. Proposals reviewed by those commissions or council obviously have public input uh, opportunities as part of the review process. Uh, so we don't want you to think that what you see today is the last time you get to, to weigh in as the site develops. You'll get to weigh in all along as each of those projects uh, comes forward in the future. We're looking forward to the opportunity with continued input from the community to transform this site into a new use for the next hundred years and think about the opportunity that we all have at this moment in time the snapshot that we have been fortunate enough to be given to repurpose this site. I wanna thank personally the hospital reuse committee members for their involvement as, as Senator Simpson said, for some of them, it's been more than six years already. And as I teased her earlier and the rest of the committee, you're not done yet. You'll still be involved in the future site development as well as all of you from the public that have taken your time to comment and will continue, we know, to give us input on the site. So with that, I'll turn it over to President Volan and uh, our team is here ready to answer any questions that the city council may have. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor and everyone who presented. Uh, it's an excellent and very interesting presentation and it's obvious that an awful lot of work has gone into it. Uh, we are about five minutes over the allotted time for the presentation. So that's about five minutes less we'll have for questions. So I really want to have a hard stop on Q&A at uh, 810. Um, again, just to reiterate, uh, this is, uh, there will be no public comment tonight and there's no vote on this tonight. Uh, this is uh, uh, a draft presentation and a public meeting uh, to, um, to get some feedback from council. Uh, and as the deputy mayor said, we're looking at uh, a deadline for any comments from any member of the public uh, through the website by November 29th. With that, I'd like to open the floor to questions from council members. I see Council Borrello. Thank you for uh, a wonderful presentation. Um, so the range of housing types uh, 
implies a couple things, but one of them implies a, a range of income. And uh, what were the discussions about accommodating a range of income? And, and what is the range of income that, that one would expect residents of this uh, development to, uh, uh, to have? I'll start the, to try to answer that, Councilmember Rallo, and then I'll let our team jump in as well. I, I know that during the discussion and in the principles, and this dates all the way back to the ULI process in 2018, uh, our community has clearly said we need affordable and workforce housing types in here. So you'll, you'll see that reflected. Now, it's impossible to tell you the exact price point of any of the product that might develop. That will obviously be coming as development uh, comes forward. And as I know the council members are aware, the city is going to own the property. And owning the property means we have control over what is developed on the site, which is great. And it also provides us with some unique opportunities to provide incentives where appropriate for the kind of housing product that we'd like to see. Uh, so with that in mind, you'll see the spectrum of housing options here from possibly plexes, um, multifamily to single family ownership. And I don't, I couldn't tell you the square foot uh, of each of those options yet. That's where the market conditions and developers will have to come in and work with us to make that work. We clearly understand that our market requires housing product under $250,000 that there's not near enough of that. And I'm picking that number kind of out of the blue. I'm not suggesting that is the affordable ceiling at all. I'm just saying we know that there's a, a lack of housing in the under $250,000 range for home ownership in this community. Uh, so I, I hope that it's a wide array of those things, different types uh, between home ownership and plexes and uh, multifamily rental options. Uh, and, and all those varieties we hope are part of what the market conditions will allow us to build. And there is possibility, uh, one of the things we're discussing as the core decision is still uh, unknown is, is that a potential site for, and not just there, but on the site generally, there, there's been some positive uh, market driven discussion about that being a potential site for um, light tech credits and tax credits for affordable housing. So just already the market is responding and suggesting there might be that opportunity on the site. And I'll let our team jump in if they have any more feedback than what I just offered. I think that that probably covers it, Mick. I, I think for the, the council, uh, we did have a development advisor on our team as well as an economist that looked at a lot of those uh, metrics that would be considered and brought into conversations with any eventual developer of a parcel or portions of the site so that those expectations would be clarified at the beginning of uh, any conversations about vertical development and delivery of any parcel. Mr. Rallo, does that satisfy your question? Yes, it does, thanks. Thank you. I see Councilmember Rosenberger and then Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Thank you, and thank you for that presentation. That was very impressive and thorough. I definitely got excited with some of those uh, renditions. Oh no, just to follow up on the housing question, I would say some of those images were um, like here we have multifamily, over here we have single family, you know, duplexes on this block. I understand the idea of scale and right, sort of having things build in a certain direction, but I. I also really like the idea of like what our current neighborhoods have in this walkable area that is a single family home next to an apartment building with eight units next to a single family next to a duplex. So can you speak a little bit to that thought of really like having the diversity of housing stock in the neighborhood, but having every block very um, diverse in its own right, I would say versus like the scale that you're trying to make sort of from like the inside out, I guess. Rachel, you might want to pop up one of the massing um, slides for this part of the conversation. Doug, why don't you jump in first and then I'll, I'll add a comment. Sure. So a uh, couple of things. Uh, the first is that I think the eventual rezoning of the site will allow that flexibility for greater diver diversity within each parcel. Um, 
because that just sets some guideposts to the zoning, but does not specify specific uh, types. So these could be combined in different ways within each parcel. Um, one of the things I think we found very early with this smaller uh, framework of development blocks, which was strongly encouraged by many in the community to emphasize walkability and activation on the streets and things of this sort. This is a good one, Rachel, thank you. Um, is that we also tested how you deal with parking. And I don't want to imply that parking drives these conversations, but in the early phases, it is something that needs to be considered so that we don't create additional impacts within the surrounding areas. And so what we found though, and maybe to answer the question, is that you can see the parcels in the darker purple on second street being higher density. And when we say 50 to 80 dwelling units per acre, that's an average of whether it's studio, one bedroom up to three bedroom. But you know, up to 80 dwelling units per acre is pretty good. And that parking can be handled within those blocks. So you can see the scale of those blocks with let's say one that's closer to first street that we could look at increased density on some of those blocks. We could also look at stepping down on some of the blocks on second street. And I think this next level of specificity around the development proposals on each site is enabled by the zoning, but perhaps can be further clarified in the conversations with developers to create as much diversity within the blocks as possible. Well, Doug, you answered that a lot better than I would have, but I would just add that if this slide's a perfect representation of if we're really trying to capture as much density and housing product on the side as we can, um, Council Member Rosenbarger, it's a little difficult to have a lot of off and on single family here, duplex there, and we, we begin to lose the ability to have uh, more housing product on the site. So uh, while it's a, you'll see again, I wanted to point out on the side by McDowell Gardens, that there is most likely where you'll see the kind of um, gradual feathering into the neighborhood of the kind of product that fits most closely with what's already in the neighborhood. Um, but, but certainly the market may suggest that there are opportunities to spread that housing product type out in other locations on the site. This was just done to try to get as many units in the most likely place where they should go density wise uh, to, to address our housing shortage. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Piedmont Smith. Yeah, I wanted to talk about financing. Um, so I heard um, a lot of talk about, you know, infrastructure changes, and even on our existing streets, first and second street are going to be transformed and that all costs a lot of money. So I wonder how, you know, before we even get somebody who's going to build the housing, how are we going to pay for all of the infrastructure changes? So those are some of the elements that uh, a component of our master planning team that you not see here tonight, although I think one of the engineers is on the call and I'm not putting you on the spot, Karen, so don't worry. But they are still a, a, amassing the cost of the master plan for us so that we can start to process that as a group before the master plan is finalized. Uh, it is important to note that First Street, for example, is already an MPO funded project. So you can kind of subtract that one out of the total cost because it is funded. Uh, by one of the, the methods that the city uses to improve its streets as it is. It's possible others could be funded in the future that way. Uh, don't forget that the tax increment that we will gain from turning this site from its current um, use, which is non-tax, a non-tax group as a hospital, uh, that many of the development that will occur here over time will, in, will bring increment into the district and, and is something we can look at and consider that as part of the way we'll return some of the cost of the investments that will be necessary to be made. And also it's important to note that we may have to decide whether the city funds some or all of that infrastructure or if the developers have to do that as part of the build out over time since this is a multi-phase project. We'll have more information about the cost elements of that uh, when the master plan is finalized as part of the report that goes along with the master plan. And 
if I may just follow up. So when is the master plan to be finalized with the financials as well? I will turn timeline. it over to Doug to tell me what he thinks based on uh, the November 29th feedback that we hope to get from the community and from the counselors. Uh, and then what time you need to turn around to Doug. Well, our, our hope, as was mentioned, we've already started that assessment. And so given the feedback and probably further coordination with the city, we should be able to have that uh, by the end of the year. I believe that was the initial intent so that it could go to both the redevelopment commission as well as back to this council for their approval. I would just say that it does go back to redevelopment commission as the final entity that um, is the entity that owns the site as, as council member Volan's already looking at me like I said, I thought you <laughs> didn't have to approve this plan and you don't have to approve the plan council members. What if we want to? Uh, well, you can endorse the plan. We would love that. <laughs> uh, we'll talk. Uh, so, Councilor Pibon Smith. So we'll have more financial information uh, before the end of the year. Correct. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions from council members? Council member Scambaluri. You're muted. I think I would have that down by now. Um, thank you for the presentation. This is all really, really exciting. Um, Deputy Mayor Renison, you mentioned really briefly um, possible eligibility for tax credits for affordable housing in that area. Can you say more about that and how that might work, how that could unfold? Well, as, as we were working with um, SB Friedman and, and Alex Crowley's on this call, I think he can jump in too. We, we've just said, well, you know, as, as we're de debating the merits of the core building, uh, and there are many, and there are some drawbacks to keeping it as well, and we're trying to flesh all those out. We wanted to see what the market, development market thought about the building, structurally uh, repurposing it and so forth. And so uh, it was actually through conversations with some folks that Alex has had tour the building where they suggested it, it, it was possible that that could be a way to fund the uh, a project if that building were to be kept. So that, that's really primarily where that conversation has been. Council Member Scambaluri and Alex, if you have anything else you wanna add to amplify that, feel free to jump in. Yeah, there was enthusiasm about the core building itself. And then generally, um, you know, I think the, the uh, city has become aware of the fact that affordable housing often uh, needs local support to be able to be successful. And that can come in the form of a variety of different uh, subsidies. So that can be land value, for example. Um, it can be uh, tax abatement, it can be other forms of contributions. So I think depending on the mix that we ultimately want to deliver when it comes to affordable housing, particularly at the lower uh, ranges of income, then, then we'll have to evaluate those proposals as they come in to determine what is the appropriate amount of local funding to support them. That's helpful, thank you. Uh, and that actually feeds into my next couple of questions, but um, can you say more about the current condition of the admin building and the parking garage? Uh, I, I'm not sure who made the comment that this may be like a 10 year build out. Um, and I'm wondering what kind of condition they're in, what the life expectancy might be. Uh, could you speak to that? Certainly, uh, I can start that discussion and team members, you can jump in. I, we had an assessment done of the parking structure, which we've already determined is uh, got a long enough life to keep it and use it um, uh, for its life. I mean, it's at least 20 plus years of life left in that structure. And, and that's all contingent on how you take care of it, right? So we've been very thoughtful about um, our conversations with IU Health and they're continuing to take care of the structure even though they're gonna depart the site. So we feel confident that it's been managed well and it, it will get every bit of the minimum amount of those years that uh, engineers have told us will be in it. Um, on the core admin building, that one's a little different. Uh, it, it is, it is uh, actually not occupied at the moment. It is um, obviously been, an, it's one of the older structures on the site and uh, we're, still in assess, we're still assessing some of the challenges of an older structure that might have asbestos in it, which it does have some, but we're just trying to find out what the potential ramifications of that are when you tar start tearing it up to remodel or reconfigure how it's laid out, if that's in fact how it's um, 
best uses in the future. And it also uh, is attached to the newer part of the hospital, the 60s edition, in a way that nobody has blueprints and can quite understand what's going to happen when they start to tear down the big structure, what's going to be behind the curtain. So, you know, we're still talking through all those elements uh, and the condition of the admin building is not as good as, not, not necessarily bad everywhere, but it has HVAC issues and just an older structure in general. So those are still the reasons why I couldn't tell you today what our recommendation will be on core because we're still core administration building, because we're still going through all those uh, steps to make sure we have as much information as we can before we make a recommendation to the Re Art Redevelopment Commission. Mm -hmm. Great, that's helpful. Thank you, and and to echo Senator Simpson and Mayor Hamilton, thank you to everyone who worked on this. Um, it, it's very exciting. So thanks. Thank you. Further questions from my colleagues, Councilmember Smith. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was great. Very exciting project, looks fantastic. So uh, that leads me to my question is, it's, it's a wonderful visioning. And for me on the city council, um, it's a wonderful visioning and the controls we have on, and this may be a question that Mick responds to as well, for us to get it to, to look beautiful like it has been um, envisioned in the presentation. How do we how do we do that as a city, and how does that how will that happen? Well, we'll get uh, we'll get the true cost of making it as beautiful and inspiring as you just uh, saw, and then we'll have to go look at our sources, right? So the, the one logical place to do redevelopment is. The redevelopment commission and it has a limited amount of funds but this this is a site as i mentioned earlier that will actually create increment uh, financing for itself over time as it builds out privately parts of it will be private right so that'll be some part of it uh, we we're fortunate enough to use some mpo money for one street we can try to program that in there are grants for some of these opportunities and then we we're going to rely on our private sector partners to possibly build out some of these elements again we're not going to do a master developed all at once plop down all these structures all in one fell swoop, it's gonna happen right. organically over time. So I think uh, Council Member Smith, the answer is it's gonna be multitudes of different uh, mechanisms that we're going to have to use. Controlling the land means we're gonna either lease it or sell it. I think we're predisposed to trying to keep the land if we can, there's a cost to that, right? But we can also sure. get some ROI by leasing the land out and have some potential revenue from the lease side of it too. So. We're going to look at all those avenues um, and we're going to look for a partner to help us understand it better as we start to work through that. But uh, first and foremost, we're waiting for the master plan to give us those basic cost elements that will inform us about what we need to do next. And the, and the people that would be engaged to help us build it, our partners in the private sector um, or our own initiatives, um, those those. Uh, say like the pla a plaza down the, the middle that looks beautiful, it would, be in, it would be the planning department and the city that would then uh, look to make it fit that vision. Do I, is that how I understand it? So again, our best control over this, it's very unusual. The city doesn't typically own land. We usually are responding to some developer who's bought land and then comes to the plan staff and commission and says we'd like to build this on there and then we kind of have to live with the fact that the, the planner i'm sorry the developer owns the property here it's like the city has a vision here's the vision if you build the vision you're going to get approval right because this is what we want to see on our land i say ours our land all of us right so if we agree that this is the right vision for the site the right master plan then we can kind of negotiate with those who want to build what we want to see. And if we don't like what we see, we don't, we don't have to let them build. I think that's the most unusual part of this property, I would say, is that the city will control what happens here. And so therefore, we can hold out if we want to, and we can create whatever, whatever incentives we want to, to see what we want built here. Thank you. Thank you for going over that. I hope that answers your question. It, it did. Thank you very much. 
Nick, I'll just follow up on that really quickly uh, for Council Member Smith. Um, so part of our uh, task here is also to develop a set of guidelines. Um, now, these aren't something that are, they're not voted on or anything, as Mick mentioned, but they are specific to um, the public realm and specifically the Greenway Plaza that you're mentioning um, and sort of the different elements and aspects of it that we feel are appropriate to kind of make sure that they fulfill that vision. Um, and so that will be handed off to the city then to um, help guide the future development um, that takes place. Um, so hopefully it helps it along a little bit more in becoming a, a reality. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's a beautiful vision. And uh, I appreciate, thank you for uh, going over that for me. Thank you. Further questions from members, Council Member Sandberg and then Council Member Sims. Thank you. Um, I too am very excited to see this coming along um, to help us with our housing gap issues. I do want to follow up a little bit to Council Member Smith's question. If this is basically city driven because we're the owners of this of this land that we now uh, have the opportunity to develop, is it possible that our values could incentivize more the affordability of anything built here? Again, our, our contribution to anyone coming along to develop affordable housing would be the offer of the land, which would make their, their uh, development a lot more uh, inexpensive. But uh, with respect to the private partnerships, I mean, aren't they gonna be more invested in market rate uh, developments and so to what extent have you thought about or I'm this is maybe a question that you know will be part of the input from the public um, could we have some assurance that a lot of this is going to be developed for truly affordable not just workforce but truly affordable housing because it is our opportunity to do that and set the tone for that and perhaps have the incentives for the developers willing to do that for exchange for the free land. I'll start and others jump in. Um, I, I do certainly think we've heard loud and clear from our community the need to have uh, more housing generally, more affordable workforce housing specifically. And I think we've also heard, but we don't want it to be a monoculture, right? We don't want every, this is not a project where it's intended to be only affordable housing and nothing else. It needs to have a combination and the market's going to dictate some of that. The right ratio is going to be driven by what development partner can come in and make it work financially and how much does the city incentivize that to make sure we get what we want. And what we want is more affordable housing product. Um, but we also, you know, this is this, this look at, that you all like, this vision, uh, it's probably not gonna be cheap, I'm pretty sure. And that's okay, look at this site in relation to our downtown and I always like to frame things in the decades ahead that we can't envision and, and that we won't possibly know what all is gonna happen, but it's possible that is that is our downtown in 50 years. That'll feel like our downtown. We have to be mindful of all these other things while we're doing this. Nonetheless, it has clearly been a principle of this development to make sure there's the appropriate amount. And if you ask me a percentage, what is appropriate, I couldn't tell you today because the market conditions are gonna certainly drive some of that. Uh, others want to comment for our team? Uh, Mick, if I can jump in, I, th I think, uh, Council Member Sandberg, I think one of the advantages of truly affordable low income housing tax credit development is that it allows us to leverage local investments against uh, federal and state uh, funding, right? And, and I think we've done that reasonably well in the past. So it does allow us to spread our money and our, our resources further than we might be able to do if we just went at it alone, which is good. But of course, it comes with a cost. And so there's going to be a limit to the amount that we can ultimately do. Uh, we just have to balance that out over time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Sims. Thank you. Um, I, too, thank everyone for the presentation. Um, I know there's a lot of work involved and you all probably have this memorized and can do it all by rote by now, um, the presentation. Um, but my question has to do with, um, I think one of the benefits would be increased housing density, which is the plan and division. Um, but I don't recall, maybe I missed it, hearing very much about public transportation infrastructure or how are we going to coordinate or accommodate um, 
with what we have existing. So can someone speak on that or has there been any thoughts um, with regard to um, public transportation amenities with this project? Well, maybe I could start. Um, one of the benefits of having this uh, connected street grid is it allows us to do two things. The first is to look at the optimal alignment of any existing transit lines or where additional transit service would have the most benefit to those within walking distance to said stations or bus stops or other modes. The other thing it allows us to do is to, I, I'd say phase, but to align those transit improvements as the sites developed over time. So I think it gives the city a lot of opportunities to optimize those transit investments to support the ongoing development over time but also in a way that the street grid actually creates connections to a broader segment of the community to access transit, whether it's by bicycle or by short distances of walking safely along new and improved streets. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. More work's required though, Councilman Sims. Uh, Councilor Flaherty, do you have any questions? Not at this time, thanks. Thanks. All right, I'll take a crack here. Could you put the slides back up? I've got uh, questions that uh, involve the slides, starting with slide 15. Um, I'm glad to hear that the core building is still under consideration, but I was also curious about, um, there's a half dozen houses on um, uh, Second Street uh, between uh, the B-Line and Rogers. Uh, are those in such poor condition that they can't be rehabbed or moved? Those, um, those are the properties leased to the, the New Hope um, Family Center. And they are in the process of master planning a new site. They are planning on moving. And uh, the, 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 I've been in several of the houses. Uh, Emily Pike was nice enough to, to give us a tour of the site uh, last summer when before COVID. <laughs> And uh, they definitely are dated, and uh, I wouldn't. I think anything is remodelable, Steve, uh, Councilmember Bowen, and and certainly could be. But it would severely limit the ability to have density on the site if we were to leave them there. And uh, as it turns out, New Hope is moving to a new site uh, in a couple of years anyway. But I mean, you know, could the houses be moved? Haven't I looked mean, into that. That that's they're, 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 they'd be affordable too, even if they need some rehabbing. Yeah, I haven't looked into that yet. Okay, that'd be interesting to look into. Uh, slide 20, uh, if you can go forward a few slides. I was curious as to why maybe there couldn't be a little bit more connectivity. If you can go forward five slides. There you go. So, I mean, I, I saw Maple Street going around Hunter School and I wondered why Jackson Street couldn't go past the parking garage to the side of Building Trades Park. I mean more connectivity is better, couldn't that, uh, couldn't that also wrap around, I mean, it would be a less of a wrap around than Maple Street is. So what are your thoughts I, on that? I, I can take a pass at that because we had looked at that quite closely. Um, from the, the right end of the arrow on Jackson Street, uh, right by the garage, mm -hmm. is close to the high point of the site. And the grade difference between that point and Second Street um, would create a very steep uh, section of a continued Jackson Street out to second where it probably wouldn't be accessible on sidewalk for pedestrians, it'd be over 5%. Um, so that introduces some challenges as pedestrian connections. Um, we could probably do it from a vehicle standpoint, but again, the connections uh, from second street into the parking garage there are also beneficial so that we don't create additional curb cuts or turn-ins from Fairview Street. So I guess the, the point is it could have further consideration in the eventual development of that block, but it was a bit of a challenge vertically making the connection. Okay, so it wasn't uh, the building massing driving the 
the grid, it was the terrain driving the, the, the way the grid. Okay. Correct. Uh, if we can go to slide 31, um, could the, uh, the bike lanes on, could there not, well, actually this would be uh, the north side of Second Street. Um, you had the bike lane, the protected bike lane on the north side of the street and the parking on the south side. Um, there we go, yeah. Uh, why not reverse them? Why not have the protected bike lane on the south side of the street like the seven line uh, is going to be and have parking on the north side? I mean, if, if uh, the, is this considered just like through traffic for bicyclists or, because it's gonna be harder for them to cross the street um, and I'd rather make it easier for bicyclists in this case. Is there any terrain issue here? Um, so I can take this question. So um, the, the terrain wasn't so much the issue here. Um, and you can see in the foreground actually of the section on the right, we're proposing an enhanced uh, sort of plaza-like connection across Second Street. Um, so we find that that could be an entrance really to this bikeway. And we, we had considered the bikeway actually along the south side of the street, but when we really looked at the sort of broader cycle network um, within Bloomington, we saw that already to the west side as you get to Twin uh, Lakes uh, Recreational Complex, that there is already some uh, multi-purpose trail on the north side of the street. And we felt that this, it would be easiest for cyclists to link up to that existing um, bikeway um, by being on the north side of the street. So it is something that we considered and it could be also something that, I mean, either side could be considered in the future as well, but ultimately we decided to, to tie into the broader network um, the North seemed like a better recommendation. And then just enhancing the safety and the ease of crossing Second Street to be able to get to that asset was the kind of move we wanted to make. Great, thank you. My last question would be on slide 52, the development okay. framework slide. Although this is just more of a, a visual aid than anything else, but um, mm -hmm. uh, the, um, I guess maybe this slide is what triggered this thought, although I don't think it's related to the slide, but um, to what extent have you considered uh, condominiums as, in other words, one of the biggest problems with affordability is um, not everybody can afford a house on a plot of land. They just want to buy an apartment when it comes to affordable housing. Uh, to what extent has that been considered, the idea that people can buy their own apartment as opposed to only being able to rent apartments. How does that play into uh, consideration of, of these projects? Well, maybe uh, if I can f respond first, but then, you know, I think part of your question is how do you enforce that uh, moving forward with developers that will be doing the vertical development on each site? Um, clearly within any of these scenarios, those options are available. I think it'll be determined by the market as much as uh, input from the city. And so how the city can uh, provide guidance to sort of those larger aspirations. Um, and again, maybe it's tied to other, uh, I don't wanna say policies, but sort of other materials that are provided as part of the engagement with developers. Okay, um, thank you. Are there any last minute questions? We've got about five minutes left for follow-ups. Anybody else? Okay, well, uh, Councilor Rallo. Since we have a minute to, uh, I just wondered about the, the water feature that's flowing through this site. Is that, is that something that is already existing or is this anticipated? Uh, stormwater from the entire site, but is it, is there already, I, I suppose, it, uh, is it piped underground right now? Is that what's happening? It is not something that currently exists, but it is designed to um, accommodate um, the majority of the stormwater collection on site. Um, and um, it, it's used as bioretention um, and, and and kind of the grading works in such a way that um, the stormwater would be all guided to that, um, that system. 
Well, it looks to be, uh, well, the appearance of this rendering is that it is a permanent feature. I mean, the water, that is, is that true? There would be times that it would be dry. Um, this would be in a, in a wet condition. So in a dry condition, it would, you know, we'd kind of read it as, um, you know, a, a swaled um, a kind of landscape bed with native plants. Okay, so it would be intermittently wet. Yeah. Gotcha, thank you. Councilor Piedmont Smith, this will be the last question, I think. Yeah, I just want to ask um, what part of the process comes next? So if we get the, the master plan by the end of the year with all the recommendations and the drawings, et cetera, what happens after that? Yeah, that's, that's a very uh, good question, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. I, I think because the hospital will be turning over parcels of property in phases to us, and we don't have the answer to when the phases will start to happen, we just know the main site won't happen until they completely uh, remediate the site, which we don't think we'll get a clean, remediated, available site for development on the main parcel until 2023. But those ancillary parcels could come over the course of next year and the year after. Uh, so when there's a, a big enough amassed space that we can market, uh, we think what's likely is that first phase that Doug pointed out on the east side along the B line uh, is most likely the first transferable parcels as well from our initial conversations with IU Health and that we could start to build out some of the public infrastructure that then creates the impetus for private sector investment. And then again, follow what comes next. Is that the Western side closer to McDowell Gardens? Because that's also what we understand IU Health is starting to vacate and won't need uh, as long as they will need the main hospital site. So as those parcels become more known when the transfers occur, we'll be able to start laying out a phasing in approach to what development will occur. And then the city will need to start hiring through its redevelopment commission, I think most likely is the starting point, um, architects and engineers to design the roads, the first phase of road development and greenway development, and articulate where those funds are going to come from, and how long will that timeline take to build that out, and also go out and look for development partners, which is why we've been trying to get this master plan done early, it gives us the chance to go out and sort of shop the vision with the market to see where there's interest. So uh, different sort of parallel tracks will define the exact steps, but that's kind of how I see it playing out in the coming six months to a year after we get the master plan as a document we can start to share and use um, the guidelines from the plan to drive the next steps. Anybody else wanna offer anything else you think uh, as next steps from your perspective? They don't want to overrule me, but so they th <laughs> <laughs> they're going to go with what I said, I think. Well, so is there an owner's representative going to be involved soon? Uh, you know, we, as, as you are well aware, we worked very hard to try to lock down an owner's representative, owner's representative spent quite a bit of time talking to one particular owner's representative. At the end of the day, uh, we agreed to, um, to break up. Uh, in, oh. a, in a fashion that we both agreed it was a square peg in a round hole. Their, their mm. methodology for going forward uh, did not match ours and vice versa. And we parted in amicable terms. And quite, a, and quite frankly, that, that uh, owner's rep is a developer and is interested in uh, developing on the site regardless uh, whether they were involved as the owner's rep or not. So we are currently looking at um, other methods we might be able to use. We've learned a lot in this process. I personally feel that way. I think our team would articulate that as well. And there may be a different model and we'll be working with the hospital reuse committee and uh, co-chair uh, Senator Simpson and, and the mayor, of course, and the whole HRC to help guide us on that next step too. So that's another parallel track is to decide what do we do now that we don't have an owner's rep identified, but we still know we need to fill that void with something. So we're, we're talking about that in the coming weeks before the end of the year, we'll be talking to the HRC about that. Thank you. And with that, I wanna thank everyone who has presented tonight, uh, especially uh, co-chair Senator Simpson and Deputy Mayor Renison and the team from SOM. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. 
Um, we look forward to the completion of it. Uh, I also predict at some time in the next decade, word to the wise Prospect Hill and McDowell Gardens, there are neighborhood parking zones coming your way, just FYI. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you. And with that, we're gonna move on to the next item on council agenda, appointments to boards and commissions.